I have played so much Mario Kart in the last, well, the last couple months, but really for the last 25 years. Mario Kart has been the gold standard of kart racing for so long that it can be easy to take for granted. But Mario Kart isn't a static thing. There have been big shifts, but gradual ones too that you can only really see if you zoom all the way out. Items and characters, sure, but I'm most interested in the track design. Game to game, there are small but meaningful improvements that can be hard to put your finger on, but over time they add up and have taken us from this to this. That's worth talking about. Let's take a lap through the tracks of Mario Kart and watch the series track design philosophy change over time. Today's episode is sponsored by Keeps. Hey, if you're just starting to notice your hair thinning out up top, you're not alone. Two out of three guys will experience some hair loss before they turn 35, but you don't have to live with it. You've got options, and Keeps can help you sort out what will work best for you. Keeps offers clinically proven research-backed treatments. The real deal stuff, not weird supplements or whatever. You'll work with Keeps' network of expert medical advisors and specialists that can help you get a treatment plan going and at about half the cost of a traditional pharmacy. Keeps delivers straight to your door and sends you refill reminders, so you don't have to think about it again, and you can stop worrying about your hair. Hair loss treatment works better if you start early, so get started today. Hair loss stops with Keeps. To get 50% off your first order, go to keeps.com slash design doc or click the link in the description. That's K-E-E-P-S dot com slash design doc. Let's start at the top. Super Mario Kart started life as a generic kart racer. Miyamoto gave series creators Tadashi Sugiyama and Hideki Kono the task of making F-Zero for two players. Hardware constraints kept them from designing courses with long straightaways and split-screen, so they focused on making a game with compact go-kart-style tracks. The original characters were just dudes in overalls, and not very memorable, so they tried putting Mario characters in instead, and it stuck. The game is made possible with Mode 7 technology, which put 2D character sprites on a spinning 3D plane to give the illusion of driving on a track. It works! See? Perspective. It looks like 3D. Kinda. It's not quite… right? But it's better than a lot of other options. Better than RC Pro-Am. Yeah, I said it. It's impressive tech for the time, but the tricks also put limits on how the tracks could be designed. So, what are we working with? Super Mario Kart has 20 total courses divided into 4 cups, with the later cups holding more and more difficult tracks. Each track is built to take 5 laps, and each lap might only take 15 to 30 seconds to complete. It's a quick game, dense with other racers and stuff to avoid, but even though the laps are short, it's not as easy as it might seem. Every track takes place in one of eight biomes, mostly borrowed from Super Mario World with level obstacles to match. Mario circuits are the most like a traditional go-kart track with some pipe obstacles thrown in for Mario flavor. Donut Plains are natural grassland courses with wide turns, a few bridges, and Monty Moles that jump on you to slow you down. Ghost Valley takes place on a haunted, rickety boardwalk with right-angle turns, pits, and walls that break away when you hit them. Bowser's Castle is also very angular with more traps, lava pits, and plenty of jumps. Chaco Islands are rugged, muddy tracks that really punish going off-road. Koopa Beach is quick and sandy, with deep water pits to avoid and the game's best music. The Vanilla Lakes are frustrating. They're ice tracks that alter your kart physics and obstruct your forward motion with breakaway ice blocks. And alone at the end is Rainbow Road, a no-safety rails, narrow, challenging track with devastating thwomps to weave around. Each track biome feels distinct, and most get two to four variants that remix the same elements. The variants gradually get harder with narrower tracks and more obstacles to dodge. Every track has one major limitation though. They're all flat. Sure, jumps break up the design's flatness a little, but you're still driving around on a fancy playschool playmat. There aren't many track landmarks to speak of, which can make it difficult to tell where you are on a track at any given time. The Mode 7 effect also feels a little disconnected from the character sprites on power slides. It's easy to swing wildly off course while drifting, especially if you're used to the controls of the later games. Lots of the series' other design staples start with Super Mario Kart, like items. Even the most basic track comes to life thanks to the interaction of the track layout and the items. Item boxes usually cluster together soon after the start line, with the occasional solo box sprinkled around. 
This is the only game in the series that does item boxes like this. Track shortcuts have been built into the series from the start. There are obvious shortcuts like the cutout in Mario Circuit 4, but this game also loves to add weird extra paths. This stop dead end, the boost and jump in Ghost Valley 1, they're intentional shortcuts, but how they jut out from the normal track loop makes them a little more in your face than what you see in later games. But what if you could make your own shortcuts? The feather gives you so many options to create your own path. Ostensibly, the feather was about avoiding track obstacles and items, but check this out. Every wall on every track only exists on the track surface. You can skip over a huge track section by leaping over walls, gaps, and other things with a feather. Worst to first. Amazing. It's a little too good, maybe. A little too game-breaking. CPU characters could conjure up a feather out of nowhere whenever they wanted. If you make a perfect shell shot or set them up to hit a banana, the CPU could just fire off that feather and miss it entirely. Super Mario Kart also introduced the series off and on coin mechanic. Gathering more coins meant your kart could drive faster, and you'd lose coins colliding with other characters or pay off Lakitu for a toe. Get bumped with no coins, and it's like you hit a shell. Rows of coins are usually a little out of the way, but grabbing a bunch can help you more than make up for the lost time. Different coin routes helped add an extra decision-making level beyond just taking the fastest line around the track. The coin mechanics wouldn't show up in the sequel, but they'll be back. Super Mario Kart was a promising start, and was full of creative ideas to make flat textures into living tracks. It's still fun even today, but there's plenty of room for improvement. Super Mario Kart gave way to Mario Kart 64 in 1996. The power of the Nintendo 64 unlocked the Y-axis, and with it, unlocked room for loads more creativity. Surprisingly, the characters are still 2D sprites that change their look as you turn. It looks a little wonky in some cases, but early 3D is a different time, man. The tracks, er, courses, use banked turns, hills and valleys, ramps, slopes, and overlapping parts to great effect. The course travels around a real landscape, with much longer laps than the first game, but now, a race only takes three to complete. We're down to just 16 courses, four per cup, but the track variety is much greater. Each has its own individual theming. Well, there's a little overlap on a couple, but they're mostly unique. Each biome in the original game is represented by a course here, and in addition, we get brand new themes. Jungles, western deserts, canyons, motocross stadiums, city highways, and like, a snow theme. Snow is not ice, it's different. The courses are much more thematic than in Super Mario Kart. Every playable character is tied into one of them, and their designs try to reflect that character. Mostly. I'm not sure what Toad's Turnpike has to do with Toad. Here we see the start of what will carry over in most future Mario Karts, track centerpieces. The courses are designed with, and sometimes around, major landmarks like this giant Yoshi egg or Peach's Castle from Mario 64. The track sections are much more unique from each other, with distinct elements in the environment that keep the tracks from blurring together. Bowser's Castle is the clearest example, having many individual indoor rooms, a courtyard, staircases and ramps, a lava bridge, and two different styles of thwomps, including this unique nightmare. <laughs> Throughout the course, this level of distinction of place is what future games will strive for, and even though it's not present on every course in Mario 64, there is enough of it for it to feel like the start of a trend. The designers are starting to add in more gimmicks too. Toad's Turnpike would be an incredibly boring figure eight loop, except there's traffic to dodge, or oncoming traffic to avoid in mirror mode. Calamari Desert has a train to beat. DK Jungle Parkway and Royal Raceway have huge jumps off zippers to add a little wow factor. Yoshi Valley is a multipath course with so many twists and turns that the game can't even tell who's in the lead until the end. Mario Kart 64 is also chock full of shortcuts, minor and major, safer and riskier, intentional and not, adding in tons more risk versus reward elements that weren't as present in the first game. Mumu Farm's inside track is full of Monty Moles to dodge. Yoshi's Valley's shortest routes are also the riskiest, including a no guardrails narrow line at the start. Koopa Troopa Beach has a ramp to a cave that cuts out a third of the lap if you aim with the right speed or hop at the right time to nail it. Rainbow Road's Leap of Faith is one of the most famous shortcuts of the entire series. Easy enough to try on your own, but tricky enough to feel very satisfying to land. Fail on any one of these shortcuts and you'll be smashed, dropped, thwomped, 
or cast away into the void and lose tons of time. The best parts of the courses are highlights, but the first trip into 3D left a lot of details to improve. The pacing isn't always the best. Chaco Mountain, Wario Stadium, Calamari Desert, and especially Rainbow Road are very long tracks with a lot of dead air, where there just isn't much to see or do. Several tracks are light on the theming and set piece integration and can be a bit monotonous. There are no coins, so coin pathing isn't an option to change the optimal track lines. Checkpointing is pretty rudimentary, so you can lose a ton of time if you fall off the track in the wrong place. Chaco Mountain, Wario Stadium, I'm looking at you. Later games clean this up especially. Overall, Mario Kart 64 is a bold step into 3D and thematic course design for the series, but plenty of changes are coming. Before we can go forward though, the next game is a detour. Back to the SNES. Sort of. The GBA is pretty much a SNES. Mario Kart Super Circuit is a second crack at the first game, bringing back a lot of the design approaches and lessons learned from Mario Kart 64, as well as a few new improvements. We're back up to 20 tracks over 5 cups, and each track is a bit longer than the original game, keeping Mario Kart 64's 3-lap format. Gone are the basic circle designs, the track layouts are much more involved, with lots more hairpin turns, tricky shortcuts, jumps, and interesting stage hazards like exploding cannonballs, boos, and shy guys. The moment-to-moment -moment decision making is more complicated, and the game feels more exciting for it. Item boxes are placed on a track more like Mario Kart 64, with fewer stragglers and one-offs than the original game. Coin paths are thankfully back, and immediately help again with making the optimal line decisions a little more interesting. The themes are back to basics, with circuits, beaches, haunted boardwalks, and ice tracks. But there are some new ones, like Cheeseland, that's not that much cheese. Ribbon Road and Sky Garden. Some tracks with older themes have a little extra atmospheric flair too. Luigi Circuit takes place in the rain. Sunset Wilds has a setting sun that gets lower with each lap. The track variety is much greater in Super Circuit, though there are still four Bowser's Castle tracks. At least each of those get a distinct background. Each version is a bit more difficult than the last, culminating in some absolute brutal difficulty towards the end. Lakeside Park has two points with jumps that can send you backwards on the track if you take a turn too wide, which can be easy to do as we're back to the loose cart handling physics of the original game. This version of Rainbow Road is one of the hardest tracks in the series, with jumps and turbo pads absolutely covering the surface. It's super easy to lose control and get launched out into space. But if you really wanted the old game back, guess what? Every single track from Super Mario Kart is unlockable. They're laid out the same, themed the same, and go back to the 5 lap format. Well, they did take out the Monty Moles and other stage hazards. The inclusion of these tracks makes it easy to see the sets of small tweaks that have improved the game over time, and this marks the starting point of the series' love affair with bringing back the classics as much as possible. Super Circuit is a cleaned up Super Mario Kart, more well rounded in its themes and track layouts while adding back in the difficulty and strategic elements that felt missing from Mario Kart 64. However, going back to the Mode 7 flat track design still ties the designer's hands a little from what they could do. Thankfully, we're about to enter a whole new era. Know what's better than one driver? Uh, two drivers, apparently. Mario Kart Double Dash came out in late 2003 for the GameCube, and I'd say it's the most experimental game in the series, with a two driver gimmick that impacts the game's item play through exclusive items and double boxes. The more powerful GameCube hardware opens the door for many series firsts. Finally, the characters get rendered in 3D. The carts have a more realistic suspension as they bounce around. Carts properly shift and tilt with the track terrain. The track surfaces are much more detailed, with rolling divots and hills. Drifting is easier to pull off, and the tracks seem to match the drift radius a little more closely than in previous games. The game's tracks are all about experimentation. We're back down to 16 tracks over 4 cups. The devs planned to add more, but they wanted to make sure each track felt like it had something to call its own. The very first one, Luigi Circuit, is an out and back layout where both tracks share a straightaway going in opposite directions. You might run into some people, or more likely, their items. As the race progresses, the straightaway becomes more and more like a minefield of bananas and other items, making it incredibly hectic for a beginner track. Double Dash is where the series starts to lean into thematic track design across the board. More details, more one-off elements, 
and even the shape of the track layout itself can be molded to fit a theme. Daisy Cruiser is an entire course on a cruise ship, from the upper decks to below. There are themed side railings, the pool, the dining hall, and even an alternate path that takes you through the engine room. The track even simulates the ship rocking back and forth with shifting item boxes and tables. There's a lot more verticality in some of the track designs too. DK Mountain is a downhill course with a gigantic barrel cannon jump to start it off. The track uses multiple types of terrain, rock, dirt, grass, and a bridge to make it feel more like a mountain than a racetrack. We've got, well, a circuit of some kind themed to something, I don't know. While Luigi Stadium is another WA-themed motocross track, but now with more stuff. Speed boosting jumps, hoops of fire, a half pipe, and moving wooden piranha plants. Compared to the original Wario Stadium track, this shows off the trajectory of the series track design pretty clearly. Mushroom Bridge and Mushroom City are revisions of Toad's Turnpike, with a more exciting city road layout and different car types like bomb cars, wiggler buses, and these guys that drop mushrooms on the track. In fitting with the city grid theme, Mushroom City has several pathways a la Yoshi Valley, but with no clearly better route than the others. Peach Beach is a Mario Sunshine themed track, full of resin NPCs and cataquack obstacles to get that Delfino flair. Double Dash does use many of its themes twice on a pair of tracks. Luigi Circuit and Mario Circuit, Mushroom Bridge and Mushroom City, Waluigi Stadium and Wario Coliseum. You can even see Daisy Cruiser on the horizon on Peach Beach. The pairs approach the theme from two different angles while sharing music. It's a small detail, but tying them together adds a touch of cohesiveness without making the tracks with the same theme blend together as much as in the SNES era. This is also the first game in the series that puts unique lap rules on individual courses. Baby Park is a seven lap trip around a super simple oval, almost like a bumper car course. Seven laps on a tiny track with a million items make this one very chaotic. Wario Coliseum, however, is such a long gauntlet that it's only two laps. Double Dash's tracks do get more difficult as you go along. Tracks are more narrow than in Mario Kart 64, making items tougher to avoid. The hazards are more aggressive, the snaky turns are more frequent, and the bottomless pits are everywhere. And the difficulty keeps increasing to the end with the toughest track in the game, Rainbow Road. This one's very challenging, with steep slopes and no guardrails in critical spots. It's maybe a little too much. Some of these turns, like the spiral ramp, feel like they're not quite made with Double Dash's physics in mind. Lakitu's gonna get a hernia at this rate. Poor guy. Double Dash is the starting point for modern Mario Kart track design. Strong theme integration, unique ideas, item chaos, and taking the ideas that worked in one-off tracks of the past and adding them into more places. This is the first step in making Mario Kart feel how it feels today. Now let's take those lessons learned and shrink them down for the DS. Mario Kart DS is one of the most well-rounded entries in the series. A nice middle ground between 64 and Double Dash, more or less. The kart handling was changed to be a tad less twitchy than Double Dash and is pretty reminiscent of how it feels in the series' future games. Mario Kart DS's tracks follow Double Dash's lead on theming, but maybe toned down a touch. New stages are visually striking and spacious, but some can be slower at points. We're not quite back to the Mario Kart 64 days, but it's a little closer. There aren't many groundbreaking new features, but there are a few. Yoshi Falls has waterfall currents that can sweep you away. Some tracks have rotating floors, a drawbridge, or shifting platforms to change the route from under you. The giant corkscrew in this game's Rainbow Road is a great novelty, and I absolutely love getting hit by a shell on it. The new additions are nice, but minor, and they'll show up again in later games. The best parts of the new DS tracks are the creative track themes, with great settings. Luigi's Mansion is a straightforward but fun tribute to the namesake game. Delfino Square combines the best parts of Mushroom City and Peach Beach by running you through a town with alternate paths through alleyways, plus this amazing shortcut jump across the river. Waluigi Pinball. It's Waluigi-themed pinball. What more do you want? You're a pinball and are dodging pinballs. Don't hit the sides. 10 out of 10. Peach Gardens takes you through flower beds and hedge mazes with roaming chain chomps. Airship Fortress is an excellent Super Mario Bros. 3 callback, as you weave through the hazard-filled upper and lower decks until you get shot out of a cannon into a castle spire. TikTok Clock takes you inside a clock-themed clock where you dodge clock stuff like clock hands and clock pendulums. I love clocks. This game is full of fan-favorite tracks.
Though they aren't all high highs, there are some shockingly low lows too. Mario Kart DS has maybe the biggest disparity in its track quality of any game in the series. There are a number of aggressively bland options. Figure 8 Circuit, which is exactly what it sounds like. Long straightaways, gentle turns, and zero shortcuts. Yoshi Falls has those waterfall currents, but the rest of the track is pretty much a take on Moo Moo Farm, with inside and outside lanes on a circle. Chi Chi Beach, Mario Circuit, Desert Hills, and Shroom Ridge are all derivative of past tracks without much unique to say about them. We're not talking about terrible designs here, but it can get boring. Okay, Figure 8 Circuit is actually kinda terrible. Please don't bring this one back. But Mario Kart DS's biggest mark on the series is how it properly introduces retro tracks. On top of the 16 originals, we have 16 more tracks coming back to pad out the content. Four tracks from each previous game. Where the inclusion of the entire SNES lineup in Super Circuit felt like a fun extra, this is the first time we see significant upgrades on each of the returning courses. Now, it's great that the retro track trend starts here, but it's not the smoothest execution of the idea. Track curation is underrated. Having four faithfully recreated tracks from each game is a great idea, but are these really the ones you wanted to bring over? Four SNES tracks that now have a three lap limit? It's another example of how the track design has evolved, but the layouts aren't very exciting with the DS gameplay. The Super Circuit courses are a bit better, with more demanding tracks in Bowser Castle 2, Luigi Circuit, and Sky Garden. Peach Circuit is yet another first track and may be a little redundant. From 64, we get Moo Moo Farms, Frappe Snowland, Chaco Mountain, and Banshee Boardwalk. Not bad options to bring over tracks with interesting thematic elements from a game that didn't have a ton of them, though Moo Moo Farms is another basic circle. The GameCube set is a real downer. Luigi Circuit, another first course. Baby Park has the simplest layout of them all. Mushroom Bridge, sure. Yoshi Circuit, the one that looks like Yoshi. The tweaks put in are downgrades though. Most of the shortcuts are removed, and the track feels way too scaled up in size to the point of feeling empty. The majority of these courses are just too simple when all put together. Something's off when Banshee Boardwalk, Chaco Mountain, and Sky Garden are the wildest picks. Too many flat tracks, circuits, and early game courses. Three of the four tracks in the Shell Cup are first tracks, and the other is Moo Moo Farm. Why? Thankfully, the next few games will keep the retro port trend alive and do a more interesting job modernizing them. Now it's time for a real game changer, Mario Kart Wii, a robust and funky character roster. Bikes, 12 racers at once, the best online play the Wii could struggle to provide, and the biggest innovation in the series to date, the Wii Wheel. I mean the trick system. Now anytime you go off any jump, or even off a bump on a track, you can hit up on the d-pad to perform a trick and get a mini turbo boost. In earlier games, there wasn't really a point to all the little hills and ramps on a track. Now with tricks, there's a reason to use them as much as you can. It really messes with you if you go back to the older games, like something's missing. It's a more obvious speed boosting system than coins were, whose mechanics were a little hard to detect if you didn't know what they did. Now tricks just give you an immediate boost in speed and can be chained with drifts to let the real Mario Kart pros separate themselves from everyone else. Tricks allow for more aerial play and strategy, and lots of courses have sections that only become a good idea if you're tricking off of them. Koopa Cape lets you choose between a river to help sweep you ahead, the road segments with items, or the ramps off to the side which you can trick off of. Mario Kart Wii's tracks are full of decision-making moments like this, with more elaborate split pathways than ever before. We're even starting to see Nintendo's famous four-step level design creep into some of the new tracks. In many Mario games, a level might introduce a new idea and iterate on it in more challenging ways to act as a tutorial that proves you can handle it whenever the game throws it at you next. Apparently, that also works in Mario Kart. Mushroom Gorge is built around these springy mushrooms. At the start of the track, you jump off one big one. Further on, now there are three mushrooms to line up and handle. Finally, the road splits into several long mushroom paths, one more difficult and rewarding with item boxes and jumps, and one more easy to navigate. Three steps, each highlighting more and more complex parts of a new element that they would add into future games. This multi-step design format shows up in Toad's Factory's conveyor belts and Koopa Cape's water currents too. The later games don't commit to this design convention as much, but you can still spot hints of it here and there. 
especially in early stages that introduce major new mechanics. The tracks in Mario Kart Wii all have a 3 lap format this time, but several tracks change themselves lap to lap. Coconut Mall's escalators will change direction on laps 2 and 3. Parts of the road in Grumble Volcano will crumble away. Dry Dry Ruins has a room filling with sand over the course of the race, which ends up blocking the middle path by the end. The ever-shifting tracks contribute to the decision-making process and improvisation that helps make Mario Kart Wii feel distinct from its predecessors. Not to mention the wild track concepts. These are some of the most creative in the entire series, and can start to feel like full-blown theme park attractions, like the mineshaft that dives and weaves underground like a roller coaster. There's a tropical mall, a volcanic mountain range, a giant tree, a ski resort, and stunning underwater tubes. There's even a track in a box factory. This iteration of Rainbow Road is as wild as it's ever been, a great and difficult track that gets the most out of the trick mechanic by rewarding selective tricks and punishing those who are tricking carelessly. Mario Kart Wii's retro tracks are much stronger than on DS, with 16 tracks added. Besides a visual upgrade, the inclusions are tweaked with the trick system in mind, adding new ramps and bumps to trick off of. While Luigi Stadium in particular fits perfectly with the new mechanics, thanks to its boost jumps and halfpipe. Bowser's Castle 3 from the GBA has tons of jumps in a row, which is great to trick off of. The selection as a whole is very well-rounded. Mario Kart Wii is a fantastic entry in the series, with the most creative track concepts yet, and the new trick system that opens up new strategies and makes every little bump a chance to get ahead. Next up, Mario Kart 7 and we're flipping back to the 3DS. Mario Kart 7 is the newest handheld entry in the series, and like the others, it's a middle ground between the previous two games. It's a less frantic version of Wii, but more mechanically interesting than DS. We're back down to eight racers, and the tracks have been toned down a little as far as how many trick chances there are. That doesn't mean there isn't anything new though. If one gimmick system worked for Mario Kart Wii, what happens if we add two more? The glider and underwater segments are this game's big new features. Both give good opportunities for new course themes, alternate routes, and changing track conditions to keep the tracks from getting stale or repetitive. The gliders solve a specific problem. The previous few games have had huge jumps and launching cannons to help tracks play with verticality, but as you go off of them, it's almost as if you're watching a cutscene. The glider gives more of a chance for interactivity while airborne, letting you gather items or catch a corner just right on the landing. Underwater segments are a little more subtle, changing the car physics while changing the scenery. Their application is a little uneven though. When the new bits are done right, they break up the tracks and provide unique elements to consider. Done poorly, they don't do much more than create a sluggish section of the track. Coins are back. They do the same thing as the earlier games, both for your kart speed and for the decisions you'll make while driving. It worked then, it works now, and it complements the trick mechanic, so it's a welcome return. I also love another new addition, single lap tracks. Some long stages are now a single lap divided into three parts. Woohoo Loop, Maka Woohoo, and Rainbow Road are designed as single lap experiences with set pieces everywhere. Rainbow Road has segments of planetary rings, moon craters to trick off of, and gliding segments all set up, so you never do the same thing twice over a single race. The new format eliminates a subtle way for a track to be repetitive within itself, and like in previous games, the different race formats help break up the game's rhythm just enough while creating space for bold track concepts to flourish. The new changes aren't as groundbreaking as tricks or verticality were in previous games, but the combination of them helps create powerful tools for variety, creativity, and pacing for the courses in Mario Kart 7. There are a few big highlights. Shy Guy Bazaar is the most unique desert track in the series, taking place in a Middle Eastern themed town at night. Piranha Plant Slide is a cool twist on a sewer track, themed around stage 1-2 from the original Super Mario Bros, with rushing water currents to move you along. Hint hint, return of Koopa Cape elements. Wario Shipyard has some great underwater segments as you drive through sunken ships and get airtime from currents. This time, Bowser gets a non-castle track from Neo Bowser City, a futuristic city in the rain with demanding turns and high difficulty. Music Park is one of the strongest tracks in the series to date and leans into its theme hard. It has three long drifting turns on instruments that play as you drive, drums that you bounce off of, hint hint, return of mushroom gorge elements, and the final stretch has a rhythm section where giant nodes bounce in sync with the music, launching you and letting you perform tricks to the beat. 
You can see how important theme integration is on the track quality in Mario Kart 7, as the weaker tracks tend to be the least extensively themed. The proper Bowser's Castle track is uncharacteristically basic, with just a few halls, an underwater section, and a ho-hum drive through a volcanic mountainside. Cheap Cheap Lagoon sure is underwater. And that's about it. The ice track is just called Rosalina's Ice World. There's the Comet Observatory in the background. That's kinda neat. Mario Kart 7's less interesting tracks aren't hitting the DS's lows, but the game can still feel a little reserved and unambitious at times. Thank god for Music Park. The retro track updates are more extensive than usual, adding new alternate routes, gliding, and underwater segments. Daisy Cruiser's pool and lower deck route were turned into underwater sections for some extra flair. Some shortcuts like in Koopa Troopa Beach and Dino Dino Jungle are redesigned with gliders in mind, and are a little more fun to pull off. SNES Rainbow Road's thwomps are neat because they make the road bend on impact, which can be tricked off of. The changes aren't all upgrades though. Calamari Desert undercuts its whole train gimmick by timing it to almost never cross the track with the players. The water current segments in Koopa Cape are skipped over with glider bits. The underwater pipe isn't nearly as fun without the river current and obstacles. Newer mechanics don't always mean better ones. Overall, Mario Kart 7 made some major additions that gave the series some incredible tools to work with, but the game didn't go for as high of highs as maybe they could have. Not to worry though, Nintendo is pulling out all the stops for its latest and most 8 years agoist game in the series, Mario Kart 8. It's beautiful. For simplicity's sake, we're just talking about 8 Deluxe. Everything from the Wii U version, including the DLC, made it to the Switch for a whopping roster of 48 tracks. Really, everything from everything made it to the Switch. Mario Kart 8 Deluxe takes everything established before, the strong thematics, the alternate pathways, the variety, the mechanical elements, and takes them to their natural extremes. Add a coat of stunning HD paint, and you got one of the most beautiful and well-rounded games Nintendo has ever made even nearly a decade after its original release. The new headlining feature is Anti-Gravity. Similar to the underwater segments from 7, Anti-Gravity tweaks the handling and physics of your cart, especially with how collisions now spin you in place. The Anti-Gravity can be subtle on its own, so Mario Kart 8 combines it with a couple track design features to help highlight it, twin roads and walls. Lots of tracks split into identical roads that twist around each other, and anti-gravity helps show both paths off at once without them looking like a highway overpass. Walls are used with anti-gravity to give another interesting alternate pathway, often on the outside lane of a turn. They get peppered with boosters and jumps to help players keep up with the inside lane. Taking the wall route in tracks like Toad Harbor or Thwomp Ruins can be a good defensive tactic to escape some of the course hazards and item chaos. There really are no limits to track design anymore with new settings and themes that provide great spectacle as you weave in and out, over air and underwater, vertically and horizontally through some of the most creative track concepts Nintendo has ever created. The set pieces are bigger than ever. A massive Bowser Golem punches the track as you weave in and out of his castle, take to the skies over beanstalks and airships, and within thunderclouds as you dodge lightning and cloudtop crews. Drive up and down a waterfall. Why not? We've got anti-gravity now. Race in a busy airport, sure. Or take to the slopes of Mount Wario, a track with set piece after unique set piece all the way down. Dolphin Shoals is one of my favorite tracks in the series and shows how much potential underwater tracks truly have. You start with a straightaway with ramps that let you breach like a dolphin. It transitions to a pipe filled cave that pushes you through several midair routes. Then you ride a giant eel and do tricks off its spine. And finally, you swirl around a whirlpool, all with the saxophone going nuts in the background. Amazing. The way carts tilt and shift with the terrain feels the best it ever has, partially thanks to HD rumble adding to the illusion. Driving over different terrain actually feels different. It's great. There are whole new concepts Nintendo uses in some tracks. Excite Bike Arena features a little bit of procedural generation with randomized ramps and mud patches. The Animal Crossing track has four distinct versions of itself, taking place during each of the seasons. However, one of the biggest gems in Mario Kart 8 is the amount of work the game puts into updating its retro tracks. 
They fully integrate the newer generation of game mechanics and are such a huge step up visually and mechanically that they stand toe to toe with the all new tracks. For maybe the first time in the series, there aren't really any low points in the roster of 48. At worst, it's like a 7 out of 10. The setting for Bone Dry Dunes is a little boring I guess. That's about it. Mario Kart 8 is amazing. A full realization of multiple generations of gameplay mechanics and stunning track design in one single, expansive package. It deserves to be one of the best selling games in the whole series. And if you haven't played it by now, jump in. Wow. That's a lot. So that's all of Mario Kart. Except for the arcade games. And the mobile game. And the DLC based on the mobile game. And that weird play from home game that came out. If you made the world's greatest Mario Kart track out of stuff around your house in that game, let us know in the comments. Otherwise, head down there and let's talk about your favorite tracks and track segments from across the series. Mario Kart has taken a long road, full of fine adjustments to item design, mechanical changes, and above all, amazing theming. And they've stayed on track to finish with the most beloved kart racer of all time.